So now we go to the next speaker. Uh, he will talk about bias and fairness in AI systems. Uh, he is Graham Erickson from uh, Alberta, and he's the lead, lead machine learning developer at Alta ML, in, uh, a company that has uh, offices in Calgary and Edmonton. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I have a slide deck. Oh, great, and it's up. Okay, awesome. So my name is Graham Erickson, uh, lead machine learning developer at Alta ML. So for those of us who, who don't know about Alta ML, we are about 150 people. We work in applied machine learning. So what this means is we partner with other companies and other industries uh, and deploy machine learning solutions kind of that can fit into their uh, workflows into their business and, and provide value. So we, we work in quite a few different industries from ag cult, uh, agriculture to energy to uh, public sector to, to healthcare and, and, and finance. So um, those would be about the big ones, but, but we've touched quite a few different industries. So uh, and the benefit of working in a lot of different industries is we get exposed to a lot of different uh, kinds of problems and, and start to see kind of a broad view of of what machine learning actually means in industry and and um, what the challenge is uh, with sort of creating um, machine learning systems are. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is is specifically within um, responsible AI. So within the umbrella of delivering ethically sound uh, machine learning solutions um, is this this concept of bias and fairness. Now I'm I'm not a researcher. I'm a, a applications developer. So we we work on uh, you know really just kind of the engineering solutions. But in getting exposed to the problems, you you have to start and think about the kinds of harms that can come out of this. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about a bit what a fairness and bias mean in in machine learning. And these are concepts that are being researched and we've drawn our understanding from other researchers. So this isn't original research, but it's more a collection of research initiatives um, that we've seen as, as important in application. Uh, then I'm gonna show a couple of case studies of real world harms that AI and machine learning systems um, have done and, and can do if uh, these issues aren't um, addressed. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk sort of at a high level about what can be done about this, and, and then we'll take some questions. So AI is changing and interacting with the world. It's changing how we interact with the world, um, and it's also having its own interactions with the world. The particular type of interactions that, that I'm gonna focus in are those interactions with humans where the decisions that either an AI system is making or that are made resulting from influences from an AI system impact human lives. Um, since there are plenty of solutions already, uh, you know, in the world that are impacting human lives, uh, we're, we're far kind of along the, the need for having this conversation. More and more systems are, are being developed every day. Um, and it's important that these systems are transparent and fair before, you know, before we go too far. It's like, what, what kind of dystopia could these systems make um, in terms of how they treat people if it's, if it's not assessed uh, directly? So the, the two types of risks and the two types of harms that we kind of consider in this bias and fairness world are allocation harms and quality of service harms. So allocation harms refer to when a system, either directly or through influence, extends or withholds opportunities, resources, or information. Uh, and this would usually be interpreted as to, to groups of, of individuals. So with some sort of social and, and systemic sort of overview. Um, so examples of this would be like loan systems. Um, and there, there are cases, I don't have the, the references on hand, but there are cases of, say, loan approval systems that are exposing sort of racial biases, right? Where certain races are not getting sort of the fair treatment uh, and there's ethic uh, discrimination coming out, of, coming out of these systems. 
uh, the, the other type of harm that we, we think about is the quality of service harms. So a quality of service harm is, uh, is when you make some product, some system, and it doesn't work as well for certain groups of people. So this would be like facial recognition um, apps that don't work with, with certain groups of people, or, or this could be uh, medical assessments, diagnostic tools that don't work for certain age groups. So there's lots of different kinds of uh, discrimination, but it's about, it's about uh, the, the tool or the service not being as effective um, for those groups. And okay, so as a company, because I'm, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of a company here today, um, you know, what, why is this an issue that's, that's serious, right? Why is this an issue that, that matters? Um, I would hope that the, that it's obvious, right? <laughs> Just as, as people and people who are thinking about what kind of world that they want to live in, that it would be obvious that these things are important. Um, from a company's perspective, there's also sort of uh, uh, things to protect around um, uh, reputation, um, social license, uh, potential litigation. This is litigation is still very new in this area, um, but it's going to be coming, and and people need you know, and, and companies need to pay attention to how that unfolds, um, and then also just unintended consequences, uh, unintended consequences in decision making, as in. You know, you you, you want to be uh, you want to understand the risks uh, and and not deploy systems and have unintended outcomes um, that are harmful for people and, and societies. Okay, so I'm going to try to make this a bit more tangible with with a couple of case studies. So the the first one this is from a system called Compass um, that I believe has been used in actual judicial systems in. Um, New York, and I believe California, and possibly one or two other states. Um, and it's it's a system that basically uses historical statistics to predict uh, which criminals are, are likely of reoffending. Okay, so they actually, and as far as I know, and there's there's the citation there for for those of you who want to dive more into this. As far as I know, the idea is that they it generates these statistics that are then used for like surveillance and parole policies. Now, a, a study from 2016 uh, showed, though, that the outcomes of this system uh, had uh, errors, errors that were disproportional, dependent on the, the race of the individual. So Black defendants from the study were identified as being misclassified uh, as high-risk uh, offenders and thus having more surveillance, uh, more than twice as often as white defendants. And white defendants were getting grossly misclassified as low risk. Um, and why does this happen? This happens because the data that it's being trained on, the data that it's looking historically, is biased, right? So we're we're coming out of a world where there's system systemic racism uh, within the surveillance policies. So the data that's being used historically to look at has that bias already. So there's a, a, a sampling bias in there. You apply some kind of statistical learning, you end up with a biased model. It's, you know, models tend to try to exploit patterns. So if there are sort of discriminatory patterns and, and biased patterns in that underlying data, the model is going to exaggerate those. Um, then being used for, to, to guide sort of those decisions around uh, real world actions, that would result in even more biased surveillance, more biased data, and future systems would be have even more exaggerated biases. So this whole phenomenon uh, in this example basically turns into to racial profiling at scale, like at a, at a statistical scale um, with a feedback loop. Um, so, so the question might be then, you know, someone might kind of think, well, why don't we just not include race in the in the modeling well maybe let's not include gender like some other protected uh and and group characteristic let's not include those so that we don't have discriminatory models well 
Here's a case study of, of a time when, when a group tried to do that. So this is from Amazon. They created a recruiting AI system. So they wanted to automate and speed up some of their recruiting initiatives in, in their hiring pipelines. So what they did is they looked at past hires. They took the just the text from the resumes and then the label they took as, did we hire them or not? Right, like were they successful in the company? Uh, and they intentionally didn't include demographic information. They did not want the AI to know uh, things like race and gender about the individuals. And the idea was, well, if, if the AI doesn't get exposed to those uh, to those characteristics, then it won't be able to be discriminatory. Well, that's not true because there's there's more complex systems at work here in the variables and in the the interactions between the variables. So tech companies, you know, notoriously do have uh, problems with with hiring fairly uh, with respect to gender. So so their their hire spits, especially in in technical positions, um, don't don't show representation across gender. Um, you know, this is a, a fairly well known observation, and it's a it's a complex problem. Um, but if if Amazon was going to use their past hiring results, which have these gender biases in it, to train the models, what would happen? So even without having the gender labels explicitly in there, the fact that the underlying patterns had those biases, the underlying data set had those biases, meant that the AI could naively learn those biases as well. So the bias, the, the bias came from variables that tended to correlate with, with gender. And the, the model taught itself those sort of patterns and actively discriminated against female candidates. So it would pick up things, uh, words on the resume that were more, most likely to be associated with uh, female applicants, like certain colleges that were more likely for, for female applicants to go to um, or certain extracurricular activities. E even things like, I think a women's chess club was something that they saw as, as a feature important. So um, removing the protected variables, removing that demographic variable doesn't necessarily result in uh, you know a fair model. Um, so what we learned from this is that there's proxy variables. There's there's complicated variables that interact with your demographic variables. And so you can't just remove the demographic variables and, and think that that's okay. Um, context matters. Just because the statistics of your data set say something doesn't mean that that reflects, you know, a, a sort of a social justice or, or a fairness or, or sort of a bigger global picture. Uh, data often it comes with collection biases and, and reflecting on sort of the context and the meaning behind how it's uh, collected is, is important for kind of understanding these relationships. And then equity versus equality. So, so just because something seems distributed equally in a very local setting doesn't mean it's actually uh, equitable as in, as in kind of fair on a more global uh, historical and social um, sort of setting. So what can we do about this? So this is where we've been looking into and and uh, taking advantage of a lot of the work out there to uh, come up with, with sort of high level steps about uh, how companies should and can sort of approach problems. So the first thing is to, to flag when a problem has risks of of ending up in one of these harms categories uh, and then kind of do a, a three-step. This is our kind of high-level pop science three-step method. Identify, explain, mitigate. Um, and luckily, a lot of the, the toolkits out there sort of fall into these categories as well. So identify, that means pick your protected variables that you're going to investigate and uh, uh, explore and kind of data mine and show where the biases exist in the data set. So identify those biases and, and how they interact with your data set. Explain, so that's use explainable AI technologies, uh, XAI, things like SHAP and Lime values um, to, to show how the model could be exaggerating and show the effect that the biases are having uh, on, on the relationships in your data. 
and then mitigate. So during the actual training, set up constraints, set up uh, training restrictions so that the model doesn't exploit those uh, those uh, complicated um, interactions and instead uh, makes predictions with respect to some fairness targets. So don't just uh, optimize for accuracy, optimize for uh, fairness across groups, optimize for uh, some accurate value, but, but with respect to fairness. So the open source toolkits to assist in that that we've identified um, at the time that I kind of did this research, which was a couple of years ago now, but these still seem to be pretty um, important. Um, uh, so these are the three toolkits we found. Uh, FairLearn uh, is a Microsoft backed open source toolkit. This is probably the personal favorite right now is and it's pretty easy to work with. And they actually have a, another repo called RAI Toolbox, um, I believe in PIP, it's RAI Widgets, which gives you access to some easy to spin up dashboards for interacting and visualizing your models with respect to these, these fairness techniques. Uh, AI Fairness 360 is an IBM backed open source one. It has a lot, a lot of uh, different fairness metrics. So those are things for analyzing um, um, fairness and bias within an ML system. Uh, it's got some really nice tutorials as well, and then some some mitigation algorithms. Uh, and then Google has this back tool called What If, which is very specific. It's all about counterfactual reasoning, and it's primarily a dashboard tool. Um, but it fits very nicely in that explainable AI, so that explain part, where it lets you uh, observe how changes in features will will uh, interact with predictions. So this is where you could set up things like changing the demographics of an individual and seeing how the predictions change. Um, so I don't have a lot of time yet I left, but I, I really don't have too many slides here. So I'm just going to quickly highlight examples of those those three categories now that the identify, explain, and bias. So identify means diving in and explaining via, via metrics or visualizations what those uh, interactions um, are. So uh, some example metrics would be demographic parity. So what this means is, this is for analyzing allocation harms. Uh, do your predictions have some kind of, uh, do they take on a, a conditional distribution based on the demographics? Like, are we predicting at different rates uh, compared to the demographics? Um, and then what's also important though is, is then is there a big difference between those two? And we could optimize to make this fair. Uh, likewise, something that's always useful to look at though is, is error rates per demographic. So it's not just, are we allocating predictions with, with some respect to some fairness, um, but are the errors allocated fairly? That's, that's a really important concept too. And so a lot of the metrics then from these toolkits can assist in, okay, I've identified my variable, can assess it with respect to these and, and go from there. Um, explainability. So this is a, a topic that really deserves its own talk. Explainability in AI services a lot of the aspects of responsible AI. Um, but with respect to bias and fairness, it would be, hey, let's look at the predictions with respect to uh, our, our proxy variables or our protected variables and kind of look at the interactions. So for example, there's a big spike here with, you know, with older ages, a kind of a disproportionate to the other patterns. Uh, and the probability it's, it's mapping is the predicted probability of someone leaving the company. So is there some kind of discriminator, discrimination happening to, to individuals above 40? This could be for this company, uh, this hypothetical company, that there could be something there. Um, and then once you've done sort of that analysis and, and have a grasp of the potential proxy variables and, and demographic variables that uh, biases exist with here, the actual training then comes down to uh, training with, with constraints. So the packages I mentioned have some techniques for, for doing your, your training. Some of them do this by pre-processing, so weighting the examples differently. Some of them do post-processing, so changing the thresholds and probability distributions. And then there's a few techniques that actually do the training differently. So have some cost function and then have 
kind of a regularization technique that uh, ensures that there's a, an additional constraint where the predictions need to equal out across groups. Um, and so that's uh, that's the talk. Um, I hope that uh, that uh, there was some new information. I know it was very superficial and high level, but I'm I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you, Rahan, for the talk. We, we do have some questions from the audience. I just would like to, to mention that, that there are other, other biases that are not the main ones like in data, but some biases can come, come from the model itself and also from the feedback loop between the people on the system. So, uh, so the first question is, how can we properly distinguish between ethics and bias in AI? For example, we will not want a weapon with AI bias towards attacking men to start all of a sudden increase attacks on women? Um, that's a tricky question. That that question is a little bit, the wording is a little bit tricky for me. Um, I don't know why we're creating an AI to be attacking people in the first place. So I'm not really sure of the underlying uh, context there. Um, I, I think that Fairness and bias is an ethical consideration, um, and ultimately, though it takes a, a lot of uh, a lot of different people at the table to be to be ensured that bias and fairness is addressed holistically. So, um, like diversity, really, really does come to play here. It, it shouldn't be just you know myself <laughs> sitting in a project and and making the calls, but it should be. You know, everybody coming together to to assess the risks and and having a diverse team. Yeah, also we add that that ethics is about, for example, uh, taking the decision, like you said, do we want to have a a weapon or not using AI? So that's an ethical decision. But bias is a problem you may find in the implementation of of a, of a system that you already decided was ethical to do to start with. Uh, the problem that we have today is that many companies don't don't do these questions, as you said. And, and then some wrong decisions are taken. So the second question is, would you support penalties for irresponsible AI? If so, who do you think should define and enforce them? Um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure if, <clears throat> if you know, I, I want to make a firm stance at this point because this is such an emerging world and I don't quite know how regulations are, are going to work in here. I, I do think we have the need for more professional accreditation with respect to AI. So we have a partner called the Responsible AI Institute who's doing really good work. They're a, they're a, a, a third party nonprofit. Um, and, uh, and I believe a, a member of, of RAI uh, Institute spoke today as as well, or or is yeah. speaking. I don't remember some yeah. word. Okay, so they're they're doing really good work in in that places in terms of you know a, accreditation and kind of setting up a, a third party kind of standard that companies can can kind of connect with. Um, as for penalties, like I, I I don't know yet. I think there are going to be legal penalties at some point, um, but I, I I think that's a pretty broad. There's so many things to factor in there for how that's actually going to be implemented. Like, um, is this something that countries together decide on? Is it like, like maybe the EU will have something, but how is North America going to adopt those sort of uh, legislations as well? Like, I, I don't know. There's a lot in the air. I think for corporations, though, and, and just social license to operate, um, we should be looking at some kind of third-party accreditation that uh, the community and the, the tech industry can uh, align on, and um, uh, you know, and gives us some kind of independent, um, I guess, trust in each other that there is good work going on. Yeah. So, so um, I think uh, there, uh, Ryan was saying that this drone exists. So. Yes, uh, I'm sure that they exist, uh, but that doesn't mean they should exist. And one problem I think in, in, in uh, as another part of the cheeky part of, of your question is that if you answer that question, you are legitimizing their existence. So you shouldn't answer those questions. It's like, 
I will not answer the question because that legitimates, for example, using AI uh, for military uses, and maybe society shouldn't have. Uh, let me remember a bit of history. We had to use uh, chemical weapons in the First World War to basically ban them. Then in the Second World War, the US used atomic bombs, and then we, ban we banned them. Should we use <laughs> AI in the next, uh, maybe they were using in drones until we ban them? So I think we are just repeating the history of, of humankind that we don't learn from history. Uh, so uh, another thing that I think we'd like to mention before I finish, Graham, is that uh, bias is very tricky to measure. And, and, and for example, I don't know if you read the, the, the work from Cynthia Rudin and her team that uh, after this compass example showed that, that really the bias was not a racial bias, it was age bias. And then, and then there was a correlation between age and race, and then it looked like it was a race bias, but the initial bias was on, on age. So basically, uh, there are many times that, that these features are correlated, and then it's very hard to know which one is, is as you said, the cause of the other one, so what is causality uh, there. So there is a last question from the audience. We can take it, and this we, we will finish with this. So, uh, don't you think we should be more concerned at looking at causality in our data sets rather than explaining outcomes? Raham, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think that would be great. I'm I'm wondering if there's a bit of a um, uh, I wonder I'm wondering if this is a bit of a leading question, uh, and and that Jonathan, you're you're thinking a lot about. Uh, causal causal inference and research and causal inference. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that industry, for whatever reasons, and and you you probably know this better than I do, but for whatever reason, um, industries behind in adopting causal inference and, and causal uh, probability um, in, in their in their systems. Um, I I'm sure there are examples, but I'm seeing it a lot less than than you know frequentist approaches um uh so that's not really an answer but it is sort of the setting that we're working in i i personally have been always interested in sort of bayesian statistics and and how we can improve these techniques and so i think that causal inference and um sort of causal reasoning about systems probably does make a really good fit and complement into how we're approaching explainability and transparency. I think ultimately that's what, mm -hmm. what, um, what industry and what a lot of our partners want. Um, we're just still kind of on the road to figuring out how that should actually work and how that'll look like. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Jachem, for your nice talk. And, and now we'll go to the next speaker, the last one. Thank you.